So um, I moved to Scotland almost five years ago now, and so what I want to talk about today is some of the work I've been doing since that time on the Isle of Skye, which is one of the best places in the world uh, for middle Jurassic vertebrate fossils. And this is work that's been done with a really fantastic team of colleagues and of students, this group that we call the Pal Alba Group, which has brought together a lot of the major institutions in Scotland to work collaboratively to discover and to study and to conserve uh, Scotland's fossil vertebrates. A lot of the work we've been doing is focused on Skye off the west coast of Scotland. And for those of you that have been there, I'm sure you know Skye as this beautiful, enchanting place, these Tolkien-esque landscapes and, of course, some really crap weather a lot of the time. Uh, but regardless of the rain and the wind and the tides, uh, we keep going back because Skye is really important. And that's because uh, along much of the coast of Skye, the tidal platforms, the cliffs, we can find rocks of the great estuarine group. And this is a series of uh, sedimentary units that were formed in rivers and in deltas and in lagoons, beaches, nearshore marine settings during the middle part of the Jurassic. And that's why these rocks are so important because, for instance, when it comes to dinosaurs, we know quite a bit about the earliest dinosaurs from the Triassic and the early Jurassic. We know quite a bit about the iconic movie star dinosaurs of the late Jurassic and the Cretaceous, uh, but we don't know so much about those in between in the middle Jurassic just because there are not that many fossils of this age from anywhere in the world. And that's really frustrating because it seems like this was an interesting, critical period in dinosaur evolution when the first birds were taking to the skies, when the first tyrannosaurs, the first really colossal long neck sauropods were evolving. And this is true, this pattern of many other vertebrate groups. We just don't have many fossils from that middle Jurassic and Skye is one of the only windows into this time from anywhere in the world. And it's not like we were the first people to recognize this. People have been working on sky, looking for vertebrate fossils for many decades, going back to Bob Savage and his uh, teams from Bristol in the 70s. A decade or so ago, Susan Evans, Paul Barrett from here in London led teams to sky. More recently, Roger Benson from Oxford has been leading teams. And for the past couple of decades or so, Neil Clark from the Hunterian in Glasgow over in the corner has been doing quite a lot of work on sky and has described and discovered lots of important dinosaur track sites and some of the first dinosaur bones from Scotland. Much of Neil's work has been in collaboration with a really remarkable local character on sky, Doogie Ross, who grew up on the island and built the Staffen Museum literally built it from the ruins of a one-room schoolhouse. And he's the only person that I know who has built his own museum with his own two hands. And that's one of the reasons why last year, Pallas awarded Doogie with the Mary Anning Award. And unfortunately, he couldn't come to Lyon to get it. So a lot of you probably haven't had the chance to meet him. But uh, earlier this year, Neil and Tom Challens and I were able to present him his award when we went up to Sky for field work. So he's very chuffed to, to get the award. So Tom, who's also in the corner over there, Tom and I started going to Sky together about five years ago. And recently our work has ramped up as this Pal Alba team has come together and as we've gotten some National Geographic funding with uh, collaboration with Roger and his team to do more work on Sky to build up our field team. So what I want to talk about today are some of the newer discoveries and some of the newer studies that we've been doing. And we'll start off on the far northern uh, tip of the island at a place called Duntulum in the shadow of the ruins of a 14th century castle. This is what it looks like on a nice day. And if you go down to the beach and you wait for low tide, that beach turns into a big tidal platform. And so a few years ago, Tom and I took uh, a small group of students there to do what Tom likes to do, look for tiny little fish bones and fish teeth. And we spent all day looking for these things on our hands and knees. And then as we were walking back to Tom's tricked out van later in the day, we started to notice that there were some depressions on that platform. And as our eyes got attuned to these things, we realized that there were actually quite a lot of these across the platform, and they seemed to form a pattern, kind of a left-right, left-right zigzag type of pattern. They had sediment deformation below them, so that means they must have been made when these, uh, before these rocks were lithified. Some of them were filled, and there were casts that were raised up, and some of these casts had little 
projections on one side. Others of these casts were paired. There was a small one with a big one. And some of these casts were really quite huge, so up to 70 centimeters or so in diameter. So it you know, dawned on Tom and me that what we were looking at were trackways, were handprints and footprints. And there's really only one thing in the middle Jurassic that was walking on all fours that was this big, and that's sauropod dinosaurs. So it would have been some type of dinosaur that more or less looked like this that made these tracks, probably about 10 or 15 meters long, 10 tons or so roughly. Now this image uh, is made by a really excellent paleo artist north of the border named John Hode. And we've worked quite a bit with John to reconstruct what sky would have been like 170 million years ago when these sauropods were leaving these, these tracks. And so this is the image that John has come up with, this kind of dystopian post-apocalyptic scene of a few sauropods picking for plants in these lagoons. Of course, always a bit of artistic license with these things, but a lot of this is based on what we see in the rock. So there is evidence for really powerful storms in the Great Estuarine Group, and also we can tell that these sauropods were making these tracks in a lagoon. Their tracks are found in lagoonal rock, so they would have been waiting uh, in shallow water when they made these tracks. So Tom and I, we, we, we published a very short description of this site to start the conservation process going. But more recently, we've been using drones to take a lot of aerial images of this site to make uh, high-resolution uh, 3D photogrammetric models. And this is work that has been mostly done by our uh, amazing master's student in Edinburgh, Paige DiPaolo. And so Paige has made this really detailed 3D model. Here's just a quick snapshot of that. What this model does is it helps make some order out of the chaos of all of these tracks on this tidal platform. And so what Paige has been able to see is that there's over 150 individual tracks at the site, and these form several trackways that cross each other, and they seem to generally indicate what we would call milling behavior, these sauropods just kind of hanging around in this lagoon. So meanwhile, while we've been working on a detailed study of this site, we've also been exploring other places in Sky for other track sites, and we've been finding new ones. And so let's go a little bit farther down the East Coast to a place called Brothers Point now, and this is what it looks like. Like Duntulum at low tide, a lot of the surrounding area turns into a tidal platform, and like at Duntulum, there's quite a lot of dinosaur tracks in different parts of this tidal platform. And we have uh, three new track sites from Brothers Point, which very imaginatively we call Brothers Point 1, 2, and 3. And so I'll very quickly say a few things about each of those sites. So we can look first at what we call Brothers Point 1. And this is a mudflat, an ancient mudflat. We have tracks, three-toed tracks of theropod dinosaurs, similar to ones that Neil has been finding for the last few decades, but also a new type of track for Sky, smaller quadrupedal tracks that can be assigned to an ichnotaxon called Delta Potus. And this is widely considered to have been made by a stegosaur, so one of those very familiar plate-backed dinosaurs. And this is interesting because these tracks are probably a little bit younger than the oldest Delta Potus tracks, which are from Yorkshire, but they're probably a little bit older than the first stegosaur bones in the fossil record. So they're some of the first records of this very well-known uh, group of dinosaurs. So that's Brothers Point 1. If we move over to Brothers Point 2, this is a lagoonal site again. We have more sauropod tracks. Some of those have really nice definition of the toes. And then if we move over to Brothers Point 3, we have another mud flat now. This was a site, by the way, that was found by a student of ours, Paolo, who was visiting from Brazil and was utterly confused by the Scottish weather, <laughs> but somehow uh, on the rainiest and, and, and coldest day of the trip, he found this site. And so there's other theropod tracks at this site, but there's another new type of trackway for Skye. We have these big tridactyl tracks, three-toed tracks, only footprints, so this was an animal just walking on his hind legs. And these are different from the familiar um, theropod tridactyl tracks. The toes are fatter, they're blunter, they diverge from each other at wider angles, and these are features that generally correspond to what are often called ornithopod dinosaur tracks in the literature. So tracks that were made by uh, plant-eating precursors of the duck-billed dinosaurs. And so the animal that made these tracks was probably about five or six meters long. And the best uh, skeletons, the first good skeletons of those types of ornithopods turn up in the late Jurassic, 
but there's some tantalizing bones from the middle Jurassic of big ornithopods. So I think these tracks add to that picture. And so with these new track sites, with the sites Neil and Doogie and others have found, we now have a lot of data and we can start to analyze those statistically to look for patterns. And what we see when we do that is, is a dichotomy. We see that the sauropod tracks are preferentially found in these lagoonal rocks and all the other tracks, the theropods, the stegosaurs, the ornithopods, those are preferentially found in the mudflats. And so we hypothesize that this has something to do with environmental preference. So environmental partitioning. And, and this is something we can continue to test as we find and we describe more track sites on Sky. So that's a little bit about the dinosaurs. But as I always have to remind myself, it's not only the dinosaurs. There's a lot more. Dinosaurs are just one part of this amazing fauna from Sky. And so in the last few minutes I have, I'll just say a few words about some of the other things that would have shared this environment with these dinosaurs. So we can go uh, a little bit north from Brothers Point up the cliff to a place called Valtos. Big shear cliffs, rock falls there. We can look for fossils in these rocks, very hard rocks, so we need to saw these things to get the fossils out. But there's some, sometimes some very delicate little surprises in there, like this tiny little bone that Tom found a few years ago that turns out to be the jawbone of a small crocodilomorph, so an early relative of modern crocodiles. And it turns out that there's another jawbone of a small croc from Duntulum, not too far from where those sauropod tracks are found but it's a different type of jawbone. So we have at least two species. But more or less, they probably would have looked pretty similar. These were small, dog-sized, primitive crocs that were living in these lagoons, probably at the interface of the land and the water. Meanwhile, farther offshore, there were other types of reptiles that were ruling that ecosystem. And we can find some of their fossils a little bit south on the East Coast at places called Rig and Berrig Bay. And this is Berrig Bay here. This is where the Storlox power station is. And in the 1950s, this guy here, Brian Shawcross, was walking around there. He found these four bones. He donated them to the Hunterian, where Neil has kept them safe for a while. And then a few years ago, as the Palo Alba team came together, we studied these and identified them as a new species of ichthyosaur, which we called Yarkvara. Doesn't look like it's pronounced Yarkvara, but it's a Gallic name. Uh, and so, interesting discovery, but only four bones. Not so much you can do with four bones, but believe it or not, a few years after Brian made his discovery, another local, Nori Gillis, who ran the Storlox power station, was walking along the beach and made a much more complete discovery. And he wrote about it to the uh, National Museum of Scotland. They came up and collected it. They kept it safe for a few decades. And then recently, we've been able to get it prepared. And we've been able to put it on exhibit. And we're studying it now. So this is another ichthyosaur, but a much nicer one. There's over 100 bones here. So this is one of the more complete skeletons of a, a Mesozoic vertebrate from Scotland. And finally, just before I close, just a few words about some other things. So I won't say much about the small-bodied animals. This is the work that Roger and his colleagues are doing a, a lot of work on and with Susan Evans and others. But my PhD student Elsa in Edinburgh is describing this incredible uh, small mammal skeleton that was found a few decades ago, so stay tuned for that. And we also are starting to get some records of the things that were living and moving around in the air. So some of the things like uh, what Dave was just talking about. So our most recent discovery uh, last year, when we were out on Sky, uh, was made by Amelia. Some of you may know Amelia. She just finished her PhD in Edinburgh with Rachel Wood, studying some of the oldest animal skeletons in the fossil record. But to take a break from Claudina and Namakalathus, she came up with us to Sky, and she found this, which is the head of a pterosaur which is complete from the tip of the snout to the back of the brain case. We can tell from the teeth it's a rampharynchoid grade pterosaur. And as we started to take this out, we saw that it connected to a lot of other bones. So it looks like we have a pretty good skeleton of a pterosaur. It's with Nigel Larkin, one of the best preparators right now. So stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have something to say about that soon. And just in general, I would say stay tuned to Sky, because as the Palo Alba teams come together, uh, as we've been training a lot of great students, I think we're just scratching the surface, and there's a lot more to be discovered up in Scotland to reveal more about this Middle Jurassic ecosystem. Thank you very much.